All right. Hello, everyone. Today, we have Rachel Waite on the podcast, a supremely talented person. Uh, She's a singer, a songwriter, a dancer. She has her own company, Holistic Harmonies. Um, You've been incredibly busy, Rachel, since I last saw you, which we worked out was about 13 years ago, which is incredible. How are you? I'm yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I can. There's been a million and million things that have happened since I yeah. last saw you. So yeah, there's a um, there's a lot to talk about. Lots to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So for those that don't know uh, Rachel and, and and myself and how we know each other, um, we went to university together at Middlesex University. Woo! Big shout out to those guys. <laughs> um, and we we was you were doing dance. Um, and I was doing drama and we sort of did some performing arts bits here and there as well. Um, mm. How was that time for you in, uh, in university? Did you I, I loved uni. I absolutely loved it. I couldn't wait to, I'm from Liverpool and uh, I couldn't wait to leave Liverpool. I felt like um, I just, I was like, Oliver, I was like, I just want to go and <laughs> seek my fortune in the <laughs> city. And yeah. um I was wanting to move to London when I was 16. And then my mum said to me, I think um, maybe you should do some A-levels and get some proper qualifications first before <laughs> going to London. So I did do that. And I'm glad I did because I had a great time at sixth, form, at sixth form as well. But as soon as I could get down to London, I was there. And I absolutely loved uni. Um, I think the biggest thing, aside from obviously all the training that we had with the, the most amazing teachers mm-hmm. from all over the place, mm-hmm. um, was the freedom like uh I hadn't experienced the freedom to go anywhere you want to go London was just a hive of activity um you could go to a theatre show or a gig or you know some really obscure improv night in Hackney any night of the week that you wanted to um and there was just people from all over the world and all different backgrounds at uni and it really um helped me to expand my own um like view of the world yeah. um and yeah just learn so much more about life that's what for me that's that's as much as what uni is for as the actual course is just absolutely life, yeah life well, experience for sure for sure <laughs> I, w- I would echo that for me it was a massive eye-opener I mean I came from a, a small town called Winchester and then I was at the age of 18 thrown into uh into the big London, the big smoke, big city life. And uh, although having said that, our, our campus was, for those that have not been to Trent Park campus, it's an incredible place. And uh, it's sort of far removed from the city and you're close to the countryside and nature and trees and it's, it's beautiful out there. Um, but as you said, it was so easy to get into town if you wanted to, 25 minutes on the, on the underground and you were there amongst all the, amongst all the action. Um, good, good. So you, so it was a, an enjoyable time for you. Did you have any, any, um, any challenges during that time at university? Any things that you had to sort of adapt to or overcome living, you know, away from family or, you know, uh, completely different cultures, meeting people from, from sort of all over the world, really? I mean, we had friends from here, there and everywhere, didn't we? So how, how was that for you? Yeah, it was, it was a big challenge, actually, coming from um, a place in Liverpool where, it was a, a really safe place, the, the little part that I was from. Um, I grew up um, in quite a strong Catholic family. So that was a big, big influence for me. And being in Liverpool <laughs> was still kind of like old school, even though it's very multicultural and it always has been, it's still, it was still quite segregated. So when I was a kid, it was basically just like a Catholic or a Protestant and you just go to whichever school is nearby. Right. Um, and that was my experience. Everyone I knew, even if they didn't go to church, they'd already been to one. They knew what one was. Yeah. So can you imagine going to London and like meeting some friends in my halls of residence who were just like, oh, what do you do inside a church? And um, what's Liverpool like? And yeah. um, oh, where I come from, we eat this. And food was a big one for me. It was like, I was just used to um, meeting two veg. <laughs> I'm a northerner. <laughs> That's what I was used to. So being in halls of residence and other people cooking like weird and wonderful things. Yeah. And I, I, I was living with um, lots of American exchange students at my halls of residence and they were doing things like sonic arts. And I'd never really 
been exposed to um like really you know I suppose more, more thoughtful um art forms I was like I want to do musical theater <laughs> I am going to be on the west end that was my yeah. dream yeah. when I was 18 and I think uni really challenged me actually and opened me up um I was really glad for the experience of actually doing an academic degree because I had wanted to go and just do high kicks and pirouettes for three years. (laughs) (laughs) And actually, I'm really glad that I didn't. I didn't get into any of the mainstream theatre schools. Um, So, yeah. I I remember you being quite studious, Rachel. Like, that's my distant distant memory. I mean, you were great at all the performing stuff, but I remember you were very focused as well. Whereas myself, on the other hand, I, I was similar. I just wanted to do the shows and, and, you know, do, do all the fancy bits. And then the, the writing and the reading and the studying part for me, I found a massive struggle, but, um, and I also got wrote like, cause we kind of, I don't know if it was the same for you, but you would often get pulled into other people's productions, particularly towards the end of university. You, I found myself doing like my own work, then trying to study, read books, learn, you know, different techniques, as well as being in like 400 different shows, like appearing randomly. Was that the same for you as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't relate to other people who say, oh, uni was such a dos. I only had six hours contact time a week, you know, people who did law or think and they were really left to their own devices and they had to just do loads of studying at home. Yeah. For, I think for us, well, I remember most of the time we were in seven days a week and that was through choice. Um, but you know, most semesters we we'd be doing a choreography piece. So we'd be doing our own choreography piece, and then you know, six or seven other people would say, "Will you be in my choreography? Will you be in mine?" <laughs> so before you know it, you're right. You, you know, you're doing your core your core lessons throughout the day, and yeah. we always had you know our our set dance classes throughout the day that we had to do as part of our technique, and then we'd stay till nine o'clock at night. Monday to Friday yeah, until yeah. they threw us out rehearsing and we'd be in every Saturday and Sunday I don't know how we did it because no. we still partied hard as well didn't we right right right, right. <laughs> we did we did yep yep um but but so yeah because I feel like the dance course was actually you had more to do than than we did I feel like the dancers were on a, on another level of and I remember coming to watch a lot of the shows I really enjoyed watching the shows and I had you know a lot of friends that were performing as dancers as well and and it was enjoyable to watch it but I feel like yeah you guys definitely had to work much harder than than we did but um anyway so so but prior to to university were you always um in in this world the the performing arts creative world what is was that always a dream for you or did that come later in life or how, how how did that work Oh, no, always. I started dance classes when I was about five years old. And, you know, there's some pushy mums who are like, my child will be a star. (laughs) I I was like, please, mum, please, please, please let me go to dance classes. And so there was a little community centre around the corner and I did tap and ballet and modern and disco dancing and all that. Um, And then it was when I got to um, sixth form, like late, late high school, early sixth form, um, I joined an Andram theatre company and they were so good. Like I'd, I'd say a, a large handful of them now, um, you know, are working on the West End and um, which is quite unusual, I think, for, for an amateur dramatic society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and That's we really did cool. Look- so, so lots of yeah. them are doing professional West End, did you say? Yeah, West End? Carl, Carl Orr did, uh, he got a big part in Scylla, the musical. Okay. Obviously they're looking for Scousers. And then, um, yeah, one ended up, uh, we did Jesus Christ Superstar in our theater company. Yeah. And the guy who played Jesus actually made it to uh, the the cast, the touring cast Amazing. and then the London cast of Jesus Christ Superstar and then went on to Blood Brothers and That's you so know, cool. like that. So, what, what, what was the name of this company that you were in? It was called Nosley Music Theater. Nosley Music Theater. Yeah, Amazing. Nosley wow, Theater. there we go. Yeah, That's and it was just, it was run by the council. Um, yeah, we went to the Millennium Dome in the year 2000 and we had a musical written for us about Nosley. So we performed that. Um, yeah, it was a really, really amazing experience. And um, we had, you know, some choreographers from Lippa who, who helped come and do the, the, the routines for us. So it was really, really high quality. And, um, it, it, you know, it felt like a, an acceptable and normal thing to then apply for theatre school. Because mm. quite a few other people had done that as well. Okay. 
You mentioned LIPA there. Can you um, can you explain to everyone what that actually stands for, for those that may not be familiar? Yeah, so LIPA is Liverpool Institute of the Performing Arts, and it was set up by Sir Paul McCartney. Um, it's actually in his old school. So it was the art school that he went to um, as a boy. Um, and, he, and yeah, he set up this performing arts school, which actually I live like one minute walk away now. Okay. So full circle. Um, but yeah, there's lots of people from Sweden and Norway, Scandinavia, who come who come to Lippa. They're yeah. everywhere. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was a fair few at uni, I think, as well, uh, including Camilla, who is now back in Norway uh, in Bergen, yeah, yeah. a good good friend of ours. Um, anyway, so good. So after after university, how what happened then? What how was the transition for you out of uni and into into the real world it's a completely well, different uh, a completely different life because I feel like we were in a bubble when we were at university it was great and it was a lot mm -hmm. of fun yeah. and I feel like we were living the dream if you will uh mine is not really having a lot of a lot of money at the time but but outside of that it was a lot of fun but then leaving there and then being like okay now I've got to actually think about where I'm going to live I've got to rent somewhere I've got to get money I've got to buy food I've got to do all these things and travel here there and everywhere I found that a little bit of a shock to the system at first but how was it for you well I basically said I'm not ready for that and I didn't do it <laughs> okay there we go there we go tell us more tell us more basically I was hiding for another year <laughs> okay so I, I went to the I so I did get my dream of going to a, a theatre school wow. so I went to do a, a professional um a postgrad a diploma in professional performance at Millennium Dance which is kind of an offshoot of London Studio Centre so some of the teachers from London Studio Centre set up Millennium Dance and one of the reasons why I chose that that theatre school is because at uni um, what I didn't realise at the time at Middlesex is that we we had been so lucky to do some very specific dance techniques um, a couple of them were uh, Martha Graham technique okay and Merce Cunningham so Cunningham can, can you tell us what they are very briefly for those that aren't in the dance world yeah. I'm vaguely familiar with it but so Martha Graham was this awesome woman in New York and she was the she was what people call the pioneer of modern dance so before people like Martha Graham there'd only really been Isadora Duncan before Martha Graham and so Martha Graham was working around the time of the second world war in the in the late 20s early 30s and um before then, all that all that was accessible with dance was ballet, and ballet is very rigid and um, prescriptive. And um, I suppose what she would think was non non emotional. And so Martha Graham created this technique, which uh, was basically all about emotions and <sighs> the breath and right. feeling uh, the body. I remember this now from you. Yeah, it was very <laughs> powerful. Her, her philosophy is very athletic as well. Right. So every muscle in your body had to be doing something while you were dancing. So even whereas the ballet arms like this, her yeah. arm was like this. So it was like uh -huh. every single muscle had to be working. And so Martha, she, she only died in, um, I think it was um, the late 90s. She was really old and she was dancing right up until her, like in her 80s. Wow. Um, and one of her life. properties was Merce Cunningham. Uh, but Merce Cunningham, really interestingly, so Martha was all about the emotion. Merce was like, I'm done with this emotion. So <laughs> all his movement was about the, the body in space and time. So it was just all about lines. Okay. <laughs> okay. But still very athletic. And I didn't realize that at Middlesex, uh, that was one of the only places in the world that they were, we were allowed to do pure Graham based and uh, pure Graham and pure Cunningham um, technique. In other places in the world, they teach Graham based technique and Graham based at uh, Cunningham based. So only in New York, where you know the actual schools are, um, are, are they allowed? Or if people come and do workshops and things. So I didn't realize how privileged we were to, to um, experience three years of those techniques and Millennium Dance Theatre School. Um, all, they had a teacher called Kenneth Tharp, who was um, one of the original members of London's uh, Contemporary Dance School at the place in London. Okay. And he, he worked with one of our teachers at Middlesex, um, who was the Graham teacher. And so I still got to do Graham technique and Cunningham technique, as well as musical theater and jazz yes. <laughs> for those that can't see this that are listening rachel was demonstrating a nice bit of jazz hands action for us all there um good 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 so 
So you were there for a, a year at Millennium Dance, and yeah. then what happened? What happened so, after that? So Millennium Dance, it very much was a, a breeding ground for the West End. Yeah. And because we because we did contemporary as well, people went off to do things like Matthew Bourne um, and, and more like contemporary dance routes as well. So that's one reason why I loved it. We also did acting and singing as well. So really improved my vocal technique and, um, and acting as well during that time. But they also prepared us for auditions. So we used to have to do audition technique and get our repertoire ready. You know, you'd have to get... Um, you'd have to get a pre-1920s musical theatre song and then a modern song and you'd have to get a song in a different accent and you have to, have to get your bank of monologues ready. You had to get your headshots ready. Wow. And um, and then I was so fortunate that the, the theatre school had an agency um, and we all had to audition the whole year. I can't remember how many people were in the year, but, um, you know, a handful of us got into this into the agency. So I left theatre school with an agent which I just felt, I was over the moon. I felt so lucky to have that. Yeah, it's amazing. And um, okay, so, so you, you left the school, you had an agent. What, what, did, what, what did you do then? Did you start jumping into auditions or um, yeah, what was the next step? After getting over the panic and fear of them being in the real wide world. <laughs> yeah, right, and, right. Uh, <laughs> thinking, oh, because I'd taken, it would cost 10 grand to do, 10,000 pounds to do okay. this one year course. And I'd taken out a loan and I was like, oh, how am I going to pay this loan back? And I've got to audition and get jobs as well. Um, so at the time I was working like weekends, um, doing music, teaching music to babies and children at a place called Gymboree in, um, in Notting Hill. Um, and auditioning, I was on that circuit with my, you know, headshots and door to door to door auditions. And finally, um, it was only three months after leaving theatre school that I auditioned for a theatre company called Erasmus Theatre and got a part in Fame. Oh, very nice. It was, it was the Italian tour. So um, by, by November 2006, I was whisked off to... Italy Amazing. for three weeks rehearsal and then toured Italy for three months after that um doing doing a musical it was quite incredible you didn't have to do it in Italian right no 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 no, no no that, 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 would, that would have been quite Although, a ironically the 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 audiences used to laugh because fame spell f-a-m-e fame in Italian means hungry Ah, um, so the little fame, fame, but um, actually, <laughs> I suppose it, it means hunger for fame as well. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Clever. Yeah, I like yeah, it. but it was really interesting actually doing that tour because it's everything that I'd always wanted to do. I thought, oh my god, I have made it. This is my first job out of theatre school, I've made it. Yeah, um, the good one to get that's a great gig to get for oh, your first one out, out traveling around Italy, and sounds amazing. Italy, if I was at that time, if someone had said to me, which country would you like to visit? Italy would have been the number one. So it, it really was a dream come true. Um, and I was um, pirouetting and high kicking across the stage. And <laughs> you got it. You uh, got it. <laughs> it, it was like being a pop star, actually. People were chasing us down the street. Kids were chasing us down the street for autographs. And we were having to be bundled back into the tour bus. Um, it was a real eye opener. Um, um, all the, and, and as amazing as the actual performances were, it, it was an eye-opener into what it's like to be on tour yeah. as well. And Can you tell us any exciting I, stories about life on the road, life being in tour, on tour in Italy? Well, I think... The, the, wait, I mean, wait, wait, within reason, nothing too explicit. But, uh, <laughs> oh, there was lots yeah, of drama. Lots this of drama, the, I'm sure. When, when you're in one tour bus and you're basically at the, at, you know, at the mercy of the, tour, of the tour manager, you don't know where you are. <laughs> You've all got to stick together. Yeah. Um, you're, you're just a bunch of, you know, people all stuck together 24 hours a day. It, it, it's really intense, mm. really intense. And, you know, we were, probably at the, we were probably all aged between 19 years old and 22. And I was yeah. 22 and I was like, I am so much older and maturer than you 19 year olds. <laughs> um, so it, it, was, it was actually a real challenge and it, 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 as amazing as the experience was, it made me realize um, that that the actual performance part of a job is minuscule compared to if you're on tour, that's your life. You know, it's different if you know if you're on the West End and you're in London, you can go home, 
and mm. have a bit of a separate life but touring wow mm. quite often we'd wake up and we'd have to say to the tour manager where are we <laughs> <laughs> where are I mean, where wow. are we in Italy and we'd have to look at a map and then you know even now when I look back at the photos I'm like well I can remember that day but I don't know where that is because yeah, yeah. we just con I just felt like we were constantly driving and then constantly doing you know dress rehearsals and constantly performing and it was a real um exercise in stamina i'm hoping the tour manager knew the answer to where are we <laughs> thank Some god he did. Anyway. He, did. <laughs> he did he did know he did know that's good good <laughs> That would have been yeah. rather concerning otherwise. All right. So you were touring around Italy. And how long were you out there for, did you say? Three months. So I got months. back. Yeah, I got back in, um, I think it was February 2007. Okay. Okay. Yeah, back to London. I found it really interesting because um, what I noticed about people in this performance industry is they're really strong and resilient and hard faced a lot of the time and they can just go from one thing to the next to the next to the next and I managed it for a few years but it was always so hard because coming back from Italy I'm unemployed again mm -hmm. I'm back to earning zero again I've just like had like my mind blown in Italy every you know for three months and um you know, I was get back to auditioning again. Um, I did, I did get a couple of jobs actually. Um, I got a job doing the Northwest tour of Midsummer Night's Dream, which okay. I ended up turning down. Probably Ooh. one of the biggest regrets of my life. Okay. Yeah. Why did turn, you turn it down? down? Because in Italy, I'd been being paid so well. Like I, I just had, I, I earned so much money uh, while I was in Italy. Um, that that was amazing. To I had, you know, could afford a few months to live off when I got back. This job in Liverpool, it was actually in, in set in, uh, based in Liverpool during the Northwest tour. They were only offering at that time, this 2007, 190 pounds a week. Okay. And even my agent was like, well, by the time you've given me 15% and they're not paying for digs and you've got to pay for travel. She's like, you're going to have nothing left. So yeah, yeah. she's like, I don't blame you if you turn it down. And I actually thought, well, I've just got back to London. I had a boyfriend at the time. I hadn't seen him for a while. And I just thought, yeah, I'm going to stay in London for a little bit. I was like, I, now I realize looking back is like, really, you should just grab all of those opportunities and just trust that you'll be able to pay your way and things will sort themselves out. But I, I feel like I, for all a lot of those years, I was a worrier. I was like, how am I going to pay the bills? I need to make sure I can pay, pay everything and look after myself. And it, that was a real struggle for me, managing. I think that's and an I'm artist sure struggle generally, yeah. isn't it? It's like, do I'm you sure take the job or do you try and find yeah. a way to make sure that you've got rent? And it is a yeah. gamble. If you were taking it, it would have been a huge gamble. But yeah, yeah I'm sure you, you've you... been through it yourself where... Yeah. There's been, <laughs> there's been day, there, there was days when um you know I'd have an audition booked in but I hadn't had any work that week and then I used to do lots of promotional work and you know a day's work would come in on the same day as the audition I'm like oh my god I could earn 150 quid or I could go to this audition and get a big job what shall yeah. I do and yeah. you know quite often I turned the auditions down mm -hmm. because I just needed to earn the money and for me like Having that balance, my heart was just in my throat most of the time. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah, I always slightly envy people that, uh, that, that had money coming from somewhere and they didn't have to worry about such things and they could just focus on doing the audition or doing the job. Because it is, it is super hard. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's always a juggle in, in that sense. But, um, well, there we go. So um, you... You also became a baby massage instructor. Can you tell us how how you got into that journey? Because I know you were doing music for, for for babies, and you were you were working with with young children. You've done a lot of work with young children. Um, but how did the baby massage thing come? Up? Is that something you've always wanted to do, or did it just an opportunity just a just arose and you went and you grabbed it? Or yeah, tell us tell us about yeah. that. Oh, I'd never heard of it before. Um, but while I was auditioning. I'd started being a nanny. Now there's lots of families in London who looking for nannies and lots of performers mm. who uh, were, were doing things like that. Um, just bits of childcare. And it was a great job because you know, a few families that I was in touch with would just say, um, tell us when you're free. I could just do with a few hours help. Um, so I could fit it around auditions really well. So I'd spent a few years by then, um, you know, helping, helping families to bring up their children. And I've always loved babies and, and kids. I think when um, 
when the performing, uh, I mean, I was I performed a lot of, of various things, but I think when I got to about 27 years old, I just thought this this is not good anymore. The dream had turned into a nightmare. I just felt like I was constantly on the hustle and chasing, and I just yeah. thought I've got to I've got to stop this. I was getting really disillusioned. Yeah. Um, I actually, from the age of 27 to 29, did not sing a note. Wow. I was like, if no one's going to pay me to do it or I'm not going to get the jobs that I want, I am out. I'm not doing this anymore. So I went back to college and I um, studied child development and I got a qualification, um, which meant that I could work in the NHS. So I completely changed. I felt like a, a completely different person. And I went to work as a health visitor assistant in Fulham in London. Okay. Did that for a while. I volunteered at a special needs school called the Bridge School in Holloway and did music therapy with them, which was absolutely fascinating. Such an eye opener there. And then I got a job on a neonatal unit in East London in Homerton Hospital. So that was looking after premature babies. Okay. And when I looked at the job spec, I was like, this is my perfect job. I basically get to look after babies all day. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, but it was uh, like out of the frying pan into the fire doing shift work and I'd yeah. never done shift work before. So, you know, really suddenly after three days training, bear in mind a nurse gets three years. I was a family support worker. I had three days training for this wow. job. And I was doing a, like basically everything that a nurse does except giving medication. Um, it was, yeah. So I was in a, in a room with, with a nurse. So there'd be six babies, three on one side, three on the other. And one of the staff members would look after three babies for one shift and I'd have three to look after. Um, and wow, what a different world. What a different world. Uh, you know, this was 2011 to 2012. Um, yeah, all of a sudden I was wearing scrubs. I was wearing <laughs> scrubs every day. I was doing night shifts. I was looking after babies who were born, at, some, some of them born at 23 weeks uh, um, gestation oh, wow. and um, looking after babies. Uh, so I was using, helping with feeding tubes and taking blood tests and plotting graphs of bilirubin levels and um, supporting, you know, um, it was such an eye opener to me to um, why, again, talking about um, moving to London and, you know, coming across people from different backgrounds in, in Hackney, in London, you meet people from every race, every color, every creed, you know, every possible country in the world yep. where it was like a melting pot. So I, it was it was such a, a wealth of experience there. And I presume um, you le you learnt an awful lot on the job. You just oh had to so just through experience, just throwing yourself into it. And uh, and I, yeah. I did you have some sort of uh, mentor around you or someone that was overseeing what you were doing, or or did you really just have to you know grab the bull by the horns? As it, you know, I think that's the saying, yeah. and uh, and just yeah. uh, go for it. Oh yeah, I won't talk too much about it because no. um, it was a difficult experience. And um, having come from this artistic background, yeah. where we're you know, and I'm a very, very, very emotional person. Like I just cry at the drop of a hat, and I, I'm you know, I'm a very um, empathetic person as well. So if I see someone upset, I want to look after them. And um, I found the neonatal unit um in this particular one I know it's not the same everywhere but it it didn't work with my personality at all I kept being told off regularly okay. for um being too soft and um letting the letting the staff uh, letting the parents see my emotions and um I just felt very very underprepared and I had I didn't really have any mentors and yeah. I had three days training and all of a sudden they're like here's <laughs> yeah. this baby this baby's this big wow. um can you put a tube down this baby's nose that is and, an, uh, that and, is a life experience right there Rachel wow I think, you know uh, uh, I think you know all of these things sometimes when I was at, at that, those points I was like how have I ended up here I've got a degree <laughs> in dance and now yeah. I've got scrubs on and I'm doing blood tests on oh, these dear. tiny babies, yeah. you know, and I was working with, you know, with um, drug addicts a lot of the time, you know, they ended up women, women who got pregnant and then ended up having babies early. And that was a really um, humbling experience and, and actually um, 
a lot of those experiences of uh, working with um, people who've had really traumatic lives, mm -hmm. um, it really tested my ethics and a lot of questions that um, hadn't really crossed my mind because I've just had this really nice life, uh, grown up in a really, you know, in a, in a nice place with a nice family. Um, it, it really made me question um, what I want to do. I was wiser to yeah. what it was like for other people in the world. And actually I, I met an occupational therapist in the, in the hospital and she was a baby massage instructor. Um, and she just said to me, um, you'd be so good at this yeah. and you'd be able to do it on your own terms and you'd be able to be freelance and you can build your own business and you can, you know, connect with these uh -huh. parents heart to heart, which is what you're not, you're not being allowed to do in, on the ward. So sounds was like a match made lovely. in heaven that. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was, that was, the, that was the start of everything that's, that's come since yeah, um, yeah. Doing the baby massage training. Wow. Yeah. So, so you went through a quite challenging experience, but then came out the other side of that and then, you got this link with with the baby massage uh, job, which sounds like yeah, all the things you mentioned. It seems like it would go together very nicely. Um, and then and so now you're the founder of Holistic Harmonies. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Holistic Harmonies. And when did that come about? When did that start? What was the inspiration for for that? And what is well, it? Tell us what it is as well. That would be good. What is Holistic Harmonies? <laughs> um, well, now, as of August 2020, Holistic Harmonies is now a community interest company, Ooh. a CIC. It's called a CIC. Um, so that's what does that basically, mean? It means that all the work that I do is of interest to the community. Okay. So it's kind of like a step down from a charity. Okay. So we get a bit more freedom. Um being a community interest company charities have a lot of um policies and procedures and um guidelines to adhere to but for me they're just it's an acknowledgement from the government that what i'm doing is of interest to the community um so it, it started probably three years ago um and by that time so that was like 2017 um i had gone back to nannying um at um quit all the NHS stuff. I ended up working as a therapy assistant for a pediatric obesity team in Hackney yeah. as well for a while. And um, you've been a busy lady in the last 13 years, Rachel, since I saw you. And, all kinds. and then all, all the way through, I'm like, what is this for? How have I ended up doing this? How have I ended up doing this? <laughs> and then um, I realized that, uh, you know, I think I sat down one day and I thought, right. So I started sing my passion my true passion in my heart is singing and dancing that's what makes me feel alive and also at the times when I felt down and sad and upset and confused and happy and joyful it's always singing and dancing that helps mm -hmm. um and then also I've got these skills now in working with families I really have honed this um skill that I've got in being able to work with women particularly and babies and, and support women in that postnatal mm -hmm. um, period of time as well. Um, and, you know, and I've got this experience within the NHS. So I understand how the NHS works as well. Um, so I was like, wow, I've got all these experiences now. How can I put all these together and, and create an offering? Um, so um, I thought, right, I've got baby massage. I've taught music to so and for so many companies now, I'll just take all the best bits and create my own curriculum. So uh, music and movement sessions. Um, Love dancing. And I'd started doing a, a, a dance um, a class, I suppose, called Five Rhythms, which um, is about embodying movement, which I've very much come full circle to from, from being at uni and have, uh, you know, or doing classes where everything is, has to be this way and that way. Yeah. Embodied movement is um, basically going inwards and just saying, well, how do I want to move? How does right. my body move? So you, you, know, were, don't... You, you were running these classes. Just to be clear. I've gone to so I'd gone to some of those classes You've and, gone to some. Okay. and I've gone to some yeah Ooh. and I just felt so awakened because mm. I always struggled with my body that you know I don't have a typical dancer's body which is why I always struggled because my you know my legs don't go as high as uh, you know a leggy uh, neither you know, do mine Rachel dancer. neither do mine <laughs> <laughs> so um 
Yeah, so I was just like, ah, oh, it just feels so liberating to move how I want to move. And actually that ties into baby massage as well, in that we're using movement of the baby's body to help the baby open up their bodies as well. So it really is a holistic experience of movement from birth for me right up until, you know, the day we pass away and um i wanted holistic harmonies to be holistic harmonies as an umbrella name for you know baby massage for music and movement and then i came across an advert on facebook that said would you like to be a choir leader and initially i was like um, no now talking about creativity i've always struggled with the word creativity connected to me for me i've always thought now i'm a leader if it was acting, I was like, just give me a script. I don't want to do improvisation. Just tell me what to do. Tell me where to stand. Tell me what to say. Yeah. As same as a dancer, just tell me where to stand. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. But as soon as I started discovering, um, oh God, this can all come from me. Um, and I suppose just age as well. You just get wiser and you just stop caring as much about what other people think. I just started letting all these things out and started creating my own things. Then this creativity started to come. And so when this advert came up, do you want to be a choir leader? I was like, mm, I'm not sure because, you know, I don't really, I don't play piano very well. And I, you know, I don't really understand tenor and bass very easily. But then I read further down, it was like, this is a community choir for women. And we use singing to empower and support and uplift and, and you know nourish and help women to grow and feel connected as a community. And I was just like, oh, that's it. That's it. I was like, yeah. oh my God, it, the, the penny dropped. I was like, all these years, all I want is to use singing and dancing to help people. And, and I want to help people. It's all, it's always what I've wanted to do. And the NHS was, you know, I was drawn to that, but I couldn't help people in the way that I wanted to in a creative way. Yeah, so yeah, now yeah. I can use my creativity and use my skills in music and movement and singing to, you know, help support the mental health of other people. And, and, I really feel like it's in these last three years I've found my vocation. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, this this will be what I'm doing for the rest of my life now. Amazing, so cool. So, if people want to find out more about Holistic Harmonies and Rachel and uh, everything you've been up to, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, I've got a website: yeah. www.holistic-harmonies.com. Very good. Uh, and Instagram: Holistic Harmonies. Facebook: Holistic Harmonies Liverpool. Okay. Um, and Twitter is HH with Rachel. HH with Rachel. Yeah. Got it. There you go, guys. Plenty of options there. I'm going to put down all of the links uh, in the description. Before we let you go, Rachel, it's super interesting to, to listen to your journey and everything that you've done and how you've overcome various challenges and, and you've, you've come out the other side of it. And you seem to be, you know, really enjoying what you're doing at the moment, which is, which mm -hmm. is nice to see and hear. Um, what uh, we're going to play a game very shortly, but um, during 2020, did you face uh, with with COVID? Did you face any challenges there that you had to to overcome? Because I presume you were holist doing holistic harmonies at this point. So how how what impact did that have on 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 you and and, and the company? So and how did in, you overcome it? How did you overcome it? Well, thank God, presume basically <laughs> right. I think everyone's so, saying the same there <laughs> good old yeah, it's it, it's I find it quite extraordinary what's happened in the last year for me and for other creative people actually um in March last year everything I was doing was face to face I would mm. never have thought to use zoom for anything creative um and as soon as the lockdown hit March 23rd last year um, me and as, as well as the other singing mamas. So I'm on the I'm on the national board of singing mamas team as well. So we were thinking, what can we do? We're like, we've got all of our choir members um, who are going to be left, and we we need to support them. How can we stay connected as a choir community? Um, so literally within 48 hours over that weekend of the lockdown being announced, we thought, right. Well, what we'll do is three times a week we'll have a. a a singing session and we'll invite a different choir leader from a, somewhere in the world to come and share a song. So I became the host 
Um, and, and in March last year, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll be the host thinking it'll just be for our choir community. Within those first three months of lockdown, we'd reached 100,000 people. Amazing. 100,000 people had That's been so cool. tuning in to our song line. We had choir leaders from Australia and Norway and, you know, joining us um, to, to teach songs. And I shared a few of mine as well. And so th that got the ball rolling and actually get this. This is the, the best thing I think to come from this is that um, I've been being paid by the NHS to sing oh, during wow. lockdown. Ah, oh, it's come full circle again. Yeah. So I've, I've been doing Zoom sessions, so singing for well-being sessions. Okay. Okay. Um, through um, in Liverpool, we've got Mersey Care, the, the NHS um, department, and they've been paying me to sing and help people feel better. That's so cool. So how how do people, if if other people wanted to join that and listen listen in or take part, how would they go about doing that? I would love for people to take part, and obviously on zoom the world's your oyster so people yeah. can join from anywhere in the world yeah. so i've got i've got new choir sessions starting um at the end of february and you can book on my website um holisticharmonies.com okay. but i'd urge people to go and have a look at singing mama's choir as well okay. um singing mama's choir website and facebook page because um our choir sessions are still going on they're called Songline. Um, and they're just little short bursts of song. Um, and, and we have got a really lovely family community on there now. So if anyone feels like they want a bit of uplift, a uh, bit of joyful singing and some some lyrics to, you know, make them just f feel feel better and more open in their hearts, then um, the more the merrier. Awesome. And Rachel has an awesome singing voice. So I've had the pleasure of listening to it in the past. Um, can you tell us about the the, the, the two songs that, you, that you're going to show and, uh, and what they're about and what inspired them? You wrote them, I presume. Yeah. Interestingly, again, 2020 has been the most creative time of my life. Yeah. And I, th I think it's because I live on my own. So I have spent a lot of time on my own <laughs> and actually what I've, what I've noticed is our lives are so busy my life is so busy generally um that there's no space um for ideas to come through right um and so actually being on my own in this time these songs have just ah, oh that's cool just bubbled up um and so the first one is a little video that i've made and it's a song called the more i love and I actually wrote this, um, I'd been with my choir ladies, my choir members, and I was um, coming back home from seeing them and my heart just felt so full. I was like, oh my God. I mean, these last few years have been really hard. Um, the reason why I've ended up moving back to Liverpool is because I've, I've um, separated with my husband as well. So I've been going through a divorce these last two years Gosh. as well. And um, a lot of soul searching, an mm. awful lot of like, I thought I was a wife. I thought I was going to be a mother. And now I'm not either of those things. Who am I? What am I going to do with myself? And I found this incredible community of people in Liverpool. Liverpool is such a supportive, loving place to be. Mm. And um, so this song, The More I Love, um, it's basically me and how I've grown. And because of these women, and I just wanted to give it back to these women. So I've been teaching this song during my choir sessions for, for, for my community. Um, recently. Oh, oh, oh The more I 
So that's one song. And the other one uh, I think you've got is All or Something, which is a yep. song that I wrote. So this is this is a typical, well, it will be a typical lockdown story in many, many years <laughs> to come. But my sister lives in Bristol in the UK and my sister got married in December. And, um, you know, we thought we might be able to go. We were waiting and waiting for the news of lockdown. Are we going to be able to go and be there? And so we could watch our sister um, getting married. It didn't happen. Didn't happen. No. So my sister and her now husband, it was the two of them, just the two of them on their own. And so me and my brother, we just thought, what can we do? What can we give? We'd love to be there in the room with them somehow. Um, and so we wrote this song for them um, and they played it. Um, just after the ceremony and they had a little dance. That, so that was their first dance was to this song that me and my brother had written. It was the 21st night and there were passing clouds so many faces in the crowd you turned around and saw each other from West Bank to Bronte. The plans will go round and round the skateboards you go. And got to know each other. Where the we here or there? 
Nice, nice. Uh, let's jump to our game before we before we let you go, Rachel. Uh, it's Would You Rather. Okay. Five, quest, five questions. But don't give it too much thought. The first thing that pops into your head. Are you ready to roll? I am. Good, good, good. All right. Number one. Would you rather live at the top of a tall New York City apartment building or at the top of a mountain? Hmm. Uh, New York City apartment building. Number two, would you rather have to sew all your clothes or grow your own food? Grow my own food. Number three, would you rather hear the good news or the bad news first? Always the bad news first. There we go. Number four, would you rather travel uh, to the US and see the sights in a motorhome or by plane? Definitely motorhome. Love it. Number five, and this is the last one, would you rather be able to take back anything you say or hear every conversation around you? I would definitely have to take back take back everything I say. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to go into that one. <laughs> uh, we, won't go, we, won't, we won't dive into that just now. Um, all right, good. Rachel, before I let you go, uh, do you have any final thoughts for our audience out there? You've had such an inspiring uh, journey uh, to this point, and I'm sure it's only going to uh, get better with all your wonderful projects and work that you've got going on. Uh, any uplifting and inspiring things for our listeners out there? It can be approaches to life, dealing with negative and positive change, all that sort of thing hmm I think the, the thing that springs to mind for me is a big shout out to all of the creatives um over the last year I mean obviously everyone has um had really challenging experiences um but obviously I'm still friends with a lot of um the creative community and people that we went to uni with and um it's been really tough there's lots of people who've lost jobs and um or had to completely change their lives and um for me, a couple of phrases come up and the, the, over the last year, the one for me is where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. We will get through it. And I just think we've, we've really demonstrated how resilient we are and how adaptable we are as, as artists, as um, business owners. Um, and we've been able to, to stay connected. It's incredible to see how people are just tweaking everything, making changes and uh, wow. Okay, good. So I like it. I like it, Rachel. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you so oh. much for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And it's been absolutely awesome having you on the uh, on the podcast. I have. It's and, been ace to see you again. It's, do you know, it's, it's bringing back a flood of memories, Warren, of, <laughs> of us doing guys and Don't dolls. Don't start crying together. on me now, Rachel. <laughs> I'm such a sentimental <laughs> person, but they were, they were such brilliant times, weren't they, Warren? Like doing, yeah. we did guys and dolls together and so other music. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love that yeah, show. Yeah, it, it, it was such fun, carefree times when I look yeah. back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good stuff. All right. Thank you so much for today, Rachel. And oh, uh, cheers, Warren. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks, then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Since we split, since the
Next year to come. Oh, I know.